practices. Management reform is a topic that is always in the background of all of our hearings and meetings regarding the Department of Defense. We have touched on aspects of it recently in discussions on budget and acquisition reform and personnel reform. But it goes beyond these issues. It includes such things as how DOD manages the funding it receives, which touches on its ability to pass an audit, including monitoring its vast inventory of systems and network of installations, how it structures its organizations and assigns roles and responsibilities to the leaders to best execute its array of missions, how it embraces and encourages positive change to improve performance, hopefully through the use of real data and expert analysis, and how it manages a global logistics system that can deliver the equipment and supplies to deployed forces all over the world, giving them what they need when they need it. The management challenges facing the department are real and longstanding. For example, GAO has put DOD's approach to business transformation on its high-risk list and cites that it renders its operations vulnerable to waste, fraud, and abuse. Despite being under a mandate since the passage of the Chief Financial Officers Act of 1990, DOD remains unable to pass a financial audit, indicating that it doesn't have good processes and controls to monitor its financial transactions and spending, and in its report from June 2020 on the Chief Management Officer position, the Defense Business Board found that the DOD culture and subcultures remain resistant to transformational business process changes. These are just three examples of a systemic problem which is not just a back office issue. These management inefficiencies and a culture of bureaucratic stasis end up costing taxpayers money because they create unnecessary waste. They slow the delivery of new and needed capabilities to our deployed forces at a time when technological change is happening at accelerated rates and they drive good, hard-working, and well-intentioned people out of public service, out of frustration, furthering the downward spiral of mismanagement. I believe we should think about management as a defense capability that we need to nurture and grow through leadership commitment, hiring personnel with the right skill sets, investing resources for IT modernization, and protecting and encouraging innovation in the bureaucracy. Unfortunately, we sometimes use management reform as a search for budget savings, often cutting personnel who provide the expertise that allows DOD to best steward taxpayer dollars and most efficiently execute defense missions. In addition, innovators can become frustrated when their ideas are stifled by the bureaucracy and a culture resistant to change. Finally, a quick fix, whether it is new legislation or a simple change to the DOD's organizational chart usually fall short and sometimes leads to new problems. I think we can do better. I'm hoping that our expert panel can help this committee assess where we are and what we should focus on to achieve effective management reform in DOD. We have a duty to our service members and the nation's taxpayers to have the most efficient and effective system in place to guide and run our nation's military. Thank you again for being here this morning. And I look forward to your testimony and now let me recognize the ranking and member, Senator Inhofe. Well, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, over the past few years, the committee's top priority has been to ensuring that we implement the, the uh, 2018 National Defense Strategy. Uh, reforming the Department of Defense remains the third pillar in the NDS, as we've read for quite some time now. And uh, the bipartisan NDS commission told us that the Pentagon doesn't possess the analytical capacity and capability to manage its daily tasks, let alone the aggressive, innovative, and reform demanded by the NDS. There are some who believe that only by cutting the Department of Defense can we achieve more efficient outcomes, and I don't believe that. We spent the first half of the past decade cutting the budget in real terms, $400 billion, and telling the Department to do more with less. Under sequestration, both Congress and successive administrations pushed for meat cleaver approaches to management. We did across the board reductions in civilians and uh, headquarters staff. We gave entire organizations with DOD flat rate cuts to manage the budget. We 
punish the people for taking risk and failing. We've required thousands of reports a, a year, more and more all the time, with fewer people and less funding. Uh, ask any DOD worker, uniformed civilian contractor, who's worked for the department over the past decade, and they'll vouch for this. We eroded our human cap capital in every area. The DOD is not an attractive place for smart, talented young people to go and solve tough problems. Our witnesses from Google and Microsoft and, and industry told us that a couple of months ago. I still happen to think we have the finest service members and the federal civilians in the world. We, even after what we did under sequestration, but they need to, the, the right management structure in the, the time and space to create, create and by sufficient resourcing to innovate and get more efficient ways of uh, doing business. So I think we can increase the budget and improve the management. In fact, I think it's a, nece a necessity to implementing the uh, 2018 NDS. We made some great strides in the recent years uh, alongside more adequ uh, adequate budgets. For example, we made more progress in the audit over the past three years than we have over the past three decades before that. Uh, we've seen an explosion in the department's uh, interest in using data to make uh, better decisions. The Pentagon is applying that to the problems from workforce issues to weapons acquisition. And we saw improvements in cross-functional teams and new ways of prioritizing budgets through, though we still have a long ways to go. So I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding the hearing and look forward. Thank you, sir. Well, thank, you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Senator Ehrenhoff. And before we begin the questionings, let me remind my colleagues about our procedures because of the hybrid nature of this committee hearing. We will not follow the early bird rule. Rather, we will recognize the senators based on seniority. Standard five-minute uh, question period will be in place, and I ask everyone to pay attention to the clocks. And finally, uh, please mute your microphone uh, so we will not have any interference given the hybrid nature of the hearing. Uh, let me again thank the witnesses for uh, being here today, and I'm going to cut to the chase and start starting with Mr. Levine and going down the panel, um, if our goal is to improve DOD management and bureaucratic processes, uh, what are the one or two specific things you would like to see this committee do, either through legislation or oversight over the Pentagon? And Mr. Levine, please. Oh, excuse me. Uh, I'm so efficient, I forgot to recognize the individual witnesses for their statements. So <laughs> with, with an appropriate apology, <laughs> I, I would now recognize Mr. Levine for his statements. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd be happy to start by answering your question. No, 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 no. Chairman, Chairman Reed, Ranking Member Inhofe, uh, members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to participate in today's hearing. It's a privilege to be here. Uh, pleasure to see all of my good friends again. Of course, it's a pleasure to see anybody in person again these days. Um, in your witness letter, you ask why the management of the Pentagon is so important to military missions and national security. My answer is simple. Functions like acquisition, logistics, information technology, personnel, and healthcare are often dismissed as overhead. But in fact, they are essential warfighting functions. The acquisition system provides our military with modern weaponry, the logistics system enables it to project power on a worldwide basis. IT systems are the basis for command, control, communications, intelligence, and so much else. And the personnel and healthcare systems ensure that we have the troops we need and that they are ready to fight. Each of these functions is exceptionally complex and expensive to, to, to manage. For example, tens of thousands of military, civilian, and contractor employees make millions of decisions every year that contribute to the successes and failures of the defense acquisition system. Even relatively minor organizational and process inefficiencies in a system like that can easily cost tens, of, tens or hundreds of millions of dollars and reduce the availability and functionality of critical combat systems. There is no way to fix a system like that uh, because these systems are just too complex and there are too many competing priorities. But there is better and there is worse 
and it's important to try to keep getting better. As tempting as it may be to seek quick wins and immediate savings from management reforms, there are few shortcuts and easy solutions rarely result in long-term improvements. Across the board reductions cut good programs and bad programs alike, adding to bottlenecks, slowdowns, and backlogs. If you really want to root out waste and inefficiency, you have to go through the painstaking process of reviewing these uh, processes and structures one step at a time. In a 2019 article, I offered 10 rules for defense management reform. Some of these rules were fairly obvious principles like don't try to take on too much, never overlook what is working, and one size fits all approaches rarely work in an organization as complex as the Department of Defense. As a longtime staffer for this committee, however, one of my favorite rules is legislation alone doesn't solve anything. In the management area, at least, if you want to succeed, you need strong partners in the executive branch who can provide engaged leadership over a continuing period of time. So what can Congress do to help? First, Congress can provide new tools and authorities, like the direct hiring authority you provided to the DOD personnel system and the middle tier acquisition authority that you provided in the acquisition arena. While there's always more that can be done in this area, annual NDAAs have already taken a lot of the low-hanging fruit in terms of new tools. Second, Congress can set priorities, as with legislation highlighting the need for the department to address issues like sexual assault or cyber policy and, and, and on and on. The problem with this type of legislation, in my view, is that it becomes less effective when it's overused. When NDAAs turn into catalogs covering every issue, then the problem is if everything is a priority, nothing is a priority. Um, the third thing Congress can do is it can provide funding. Management reforms, as, as the chairman noted, are often viewed as a cash cow, but the secret is that real improvement often requires upfront investment. If you want those savings down the road, you may have to put up money up front. Beyond that, management reforms don't always yield savings. They may yield better practices and more efficient, more, more effective practices that provide better, better support to the warfighter rather than money back to the taxpayer. So to give you an example, the department really needs better data systems to make better decisions. It really needs new skills and capabilities in its workforce. Um, areas like advanced uh, software and cyber skills, for example. Those are things that if you really want to have them, if you really want to achieve them, you need to put money into the system, not take money out. The final thing that Congress can do is to conduct oversight. In many ways, your most valuable tool as a member of Congress, and I don't think I need to tell you that, but in many ways, your most valuable tool is your own time. Officials all over the Pentagon watch how, how the Secretary of Defense spends his time because they know that, that, that the commitment of time reflects priorities. The same is true of you. The people in the Pentagon pay attention when you call them, call them to account. Congress can't manage the Pentagon, but it can show the, depend, the Pentagon that it believes management reform is important. This hearing is a good step in that direction. That concludes my statement, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Levine. Uh, Ms. Field? Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Reed, Ranking Member Inhofe, and members and staff of the committee. It is an honor to testify before you today on GAO's work regarding DOD's management challenges and opportunities. This hearing could not come at a more important time. As more and more Americans get inoculated against the COVID-19 virus and the country begins its economic recovery, we must once again turn our attention to addressing the nation's unsustainable long-term fiscal path. Under our projections, the debt will reach its highest point in history only seven years from now. The defense budget, as you know, is the largest single category of discretionary spending, making it a key component of any discussion about future federal spending. At the same time, we face a complex array of threats to our national security, from the political and military advancement of near-peer competitors, such as China and Russia, to the introduction of increasingly sophisticated dual-use technologies, to the development of new and dangerous weapons. Reforming how the Department of Defense is managed, if done effectively, can help address both sets of challenges by lowering costs, reducing waste, and delivering better and faster support to the warfighter. In their work, Mr. Levine and Dr. Grant offer compelling ideas about reform, one from an insider's perspective, offering a recipe for operating effectively within DOD's organizational culture, the other from an outsider's view, 
providing examples of reformers who have succeeded through original and nonconformist thinking. This morning, I would like to share two thoughts based on GAO's work about what those responsible for defense management reform must have in order to succeed, whether they be practical incrementalists or innovative originals. Namely, they must be enabled and they must be empowered. First, reformers must be enabled through the use of complete and accurate data and resources to turn their ideas into reality. DOD suffers from an alarming lack of accurate and consistent data on almost all of its core business functions. This problem makes it exceptionally difficult for anyone who wants to drive change. Our reports cite numerous instances in which DOD data were so unreliable or inconsistent that we could not assess the underlying issue. To give you one small example, when we assessed how DOD manages human resources delivery, things like hiring and onboarding personnel, we found that at least three different defense agencies and field activities, as well as all three military departments, provided some human resources services to other DOD components. In fact, one DOD component received these services from all six. Department officials, to their credit, recognized that this arrangement was less than efficient and sought to develop better solutions for human resources service delivery. But they were stymied by a lack of available data. For example, although they wanted to reduce the time to hire, a key metric for assessing the performance of human resources service delivery, they found that no one in the department defined that metric the same way or collected the same data, making comparisons nearly impossible. Likewise, those attempting to drive reform at the department have been hindered by a lack of upfront resources, something Mr. Levine also spoke about. In 2019, when we examined the department's efforts to establish cross-functional teams charged with finding new ways to increase efficiency in key business operations, we found that many of them were stuck trying to find resources to pilot test their ideas or initiate phase one of their reforms. Second, to be effective at DOD, reformers must be empowered with clearly defined roles and authorities and sustained support from the very top. A few years ago, when Congress created a standalone chief management officer position at the department, we closely monitored how this position was being implemented, recognizing it as an opportunity for real change. Unfortunately, we found that while the legislation creating the CMO position envisioned a senior official with significant responsibilities and authorities, the department did not truly realize that vision. For example, although the statute allowed for the CMO to have the authority to direct the military departments in matters related to business operations, the CMO was not empowered to fully execute that authority when needed. With the recent elimination of that position, the department must find a new way to enable and empower those who can see a different future for this most critical organization. We will be watching this new chapter play out with keen interest. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Fields. Uh, Dr. Grant, please. Uh, please put your microphone on, doctor. There we go. One more time, Chairman Reed, Ranking Member Inhofe, and members of the committee, it's an honor to be invited here to discuss defense management. I'm an organizational psychologist. I spent four years on the Defense Innovation Board, and I've also spent time teaching leadership to generals and admirals and doing research on military bases. I have deep admiration for our service members and DOD civilians. I also worry that DOD's culture is a threat to national security. Culture is the system of values and norms that govern behavior, how we do things around here. Culture can shape whether organizations are built to last or doomed to perish. It has a dramatic impact on performance and innovation. And I believe DOD culture stifles innovation. In the DOD, innovation is mostly discussed in terms of new technology. But innovation ultimately rests on people. Buying all the advanced machines, software, and data in the world doesn't guarantee that people will rethink old strategies and develop new ones. Our ability to anticipate our adversaries' moves and avoid falling behind depends on a culture of innovation, values and norms that support the generation and successful implementation of creative ideas. We know that good management is the lifeblood of innovation. There's evidence from the software industry, for example, that managers have tripled the impact of individual innovators on performance. But I'm afraid that DOD is still, by and large, doing 1950s-era management. During my time on the Defense Innovation Board, I consistently heard three sentiments from leaders and managers that undermine a culture of innovation. The first is, that's too risky. On my visits to military bases, I heard many junior people say different things behind leaders' backs than to their faces. 
That's a symptom that people lack psychological safety, the freedom to take risks without the fear of being punished. We have extensive evidence that a culture of psychological safety is critical to preventing threats and promoting innovation. When people lack psychological safety, they aim to prove themselves and protect their image. They hide their mistakes and withhold their ideas. When people have psychological safety, they strive to improve themselves and protect the mission. They admit errors and voice suggestions. We need to train leaders to build psychological safety, to empower canaries in the coal mine to raise problems even if they haven't figured out yet how to solve them, to make it clear to junior people that speaking up about issues and ideas will not jeopardize their reputations or their careers, to give them the authority and the resources to champion change. Yeah, change carries risk, but not changing is risky too. It leaves us predictable and vulnerable to attack. The second sentiment that concerns me is, that's not the way we've always done it. When junior people have the courage to raise new ideas, I've seen too many DOD leaders dismiss them. Research reveals that deep experience often leads to cognitive entrenchment. Leaders start to take for granted ideas that need to be questioned. They overestimate the quality of their own ideas and underestimate the potential in new directions. They cling to tried and true best practices instead of aiming to test and learn in search of better practices. DOD should be running more experiments. We need more innovation tournaments where people compete to solve problems. We need to stop punishing people who have good ideas with bad outcomes and start rewarding people who have promising ideas with uncertain outcomes. The third sentiment that haunts me is, that will never work here. On too many occasions, I've seen leaders reject ideas because they came from outside the military. There's a name for this too. It's called organizational uniqueness bias. Yeah, there are aspects of DOD that are unique, but there are also fundamental similarities across people and industries, and overlooking those parallels closes the door to learning from universities and from Silicon Valley. The organizational uniqueness bias is not unique to DOD. At Google, for example, engineers were convinced that they needed to build their own management playbook, and they found that what set their best managers apart was the same set of behaviors as everywhere else, like empowering teams and coaching individuals. Then I challenged them to study their great teams, and they discovered that the single most important driver of team performance was not individual talent, it was the psychological safety that leaders created. Sound familiar? There's a lot that DOD could learn from other organizational cultures. The fact that something wasn't invented here doesn't mean it won't apply here. We need scouts and ambassadors to make connections outside the military and government and explore new management practices. We also need them to study the range of practices inside the DOD itself. DOD is not one single culture, it's full of subcultures. And one of the silver linings of being a massive organization is that there are always bright spots, pockets of excellence. Some DOD examples that I've seen include Kessel Run, the Defense Innovation Unit, the National Security Innovation Network, AFWorks, Naval X, and the new Army Software Factory. However many leaders shut down psychological safety, new ideas, and outside perspectives, you can find some who are encouraging people to take risks rethink best practices, and learn from beyond the defense industry. If I were in your shoes, I might start by identifying those leaders and studying what they do. I'd work to disseminate those better practices and give those organizations additional people, resources, and flexibilities. These bright spots exist in spite of institutional resistance, which exhausts their people and sometimes imperils their survival. It's time for DOD to embrace these outliers and strive to build a culture where they're the norm, not the exception. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Grant. Thank you all for your excellent testimony. I've already indicated how eager I am to engage the panel, so let me repeat my question, forgive me. Uh, and starting with Ms. Levine, if there's two specific things you'd like to see done, either legislatively or through our oversight, which are the two major ways in which we influence the behavior of DOD, what, what would they be? Well, I think the list is probably a little longer than that, but I'll, I'll, I'll focus in on... You can go longer. I'll focus in on, on what I think is one of the key challenges uh, facing the department, which is access to talent in areas like cyber, AI, software. Um, I, the, the list goes on and on, digital engineering, modeling and simulation, um, places where we have to compete with the private sector for, for talent, where we have some, some of the best that, that's available in the world, but it's not necessarily available to the Department of Defense. Um, one of the things that I think we need to think about seriously there is 
how do we how do we hire and bring on civilians and and and, and how do we treat our civilian workforce? I think there have been, there have been any number of reports in, in recent years, and, and Senator King's Cyber Solarium is one of them that have pointed to this problem. There have been a series of recommendations about changes for the for the for the civilian workforce. Frankly, I think this committee has already taken a lot of action to improve authorities available to the civilian workforce. What that does not bring together is the focus in the Department of Defense to believe that the civilian workforce is actually important. Um, and this goes back to what I was talking about earlier about is there money uh, where the authority is. So you have direct hiring authority, you have a lot of tools. There are places in the department where there is focus, where, where there are intake systems like cohort hiring, which is something I'm looking right now at the Institute for Defense Analyses, where you, where you bring in new entrants in, in, in areas and you train them up and give them rotational job assignments and, and team building exercises. You, you invest in them, show them that, that they're important. You attract better people into the workforce in this way. One thing that's happening in the department right now is at the same time that we're saying we need new skills, we're cutting funding for those programs uh, because there isn't because they're overhead and we don't have enough money to go around and civilian workforce is one of the first things that you cut. Um, so we need to think about investing in our civilian workforce if we want to build those kinds of new skills. Uh, that would be at the top of my list, Senator. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Field, please. Uh, well, I agree uh, with what Mr. Levine said. In fact, when we assessed a few years ago the defense laboratories and how they were using the direct hire authority to uh, recruit uh, talent, we found that they used that authority more than any other authority available to them, so it was really critical. Uh, the two things I would add to that are to the extent that this committee uh, and Congress legislates uh, reform at the department, which it has done many years, uh, I would encourage that legislation to align with the way in which the department structures its, its uh, information and its systems. So, for example, a few years ago, uh, Congress, as I'm sure you're aware, mandated the CMO to develop cost baselines and associated savings with four business lines of effort, things like real estate management and civilian resource management. But the department didn't necessarily organize its information, including its financial information, consistent with those definitions. And so the CMO was left sort of spinning her wheels trying to, to figure out how to uh, comply with this mandate. The second thing I would say, and, and you mentioned this in your opening statement, is support for the full financial audit. Uh, it's, this is not a, a, a paper exercise. This is not about bean counting. Uh, fundamentally, the full financial audit is a catalyst for uh, the department getting better information to make better informed management decisions. Thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Grant, please. Well, I'll just give you one idea. I think the DOD has done a brilliant job investing in quality of life for people. I think we needed to be as brilliant in investing in the quality of their ideas. I mentioned the idea of innovation tournaments as an approach to that. Uh, an example in a chemical company that I had a chance to witness up close is they said, all right, we're looking for ideas that will save energy and reduce waste. We will welcome proposals from across the organization uh, as long as they have to, uh, the potential to pay for themselves within a year. Uh, and they basically let anybody submit ideas. They evaluate proposals. They advance the promising ones to round two. And then eventually the company bets on the most high potential ideas. They end up doing this for a decade. They bet on 575 ideas. And they save the company $110 million per year on average. These are not mostly ideas coming from people in creative jobs. They're often people on a factory floor who saw a system that was broken but didn't know where to take their solution until the innovation tournament was announced. I would love to see more of those tournaments run, and we need the incentives to back them up, right, to encourage people who have ideas to speak up, to share their ideas, to go and test them, and then reward them and recognize them for doing that as opposed to punishing them for taking risks. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all. Uh, Senator Inhofe, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, a lot of uh, reviews of the Pentagon management practices tell us that many of the officials, and we're talking about civilian and military, have little experience with the private sector and are not uh, aware of even basic modern management tools. And I, I experienced this uh, from my own. I had a whole career long before I got into this thing. and. And uh, it's it's it was always obvious to me that we didn't have didn't have uh, you know a lot of the private sector experiences. So I'd like to have each of you comment how far behind the private sector do you think the Pentagon is in terms of management practices, and what's your number one recommendation to fix this? 
Let's start with Peter there. So first of all, I would say the department is light years behind the private sector in terms of management practices. Um, I don't know that bringing in people from the private sector is an answer to that by itself. I think it's good for the department to have in leadership a mix of people with private sector experience and government experience um, because there are so many unique factors about the way the department works and we sometimes see people come in from the private sector who are unfamiliar with the way the department works and, and, and are fish out of water and, and are unable and, and are frustrated immediately by the department and find it difficult to get anything done. Um, I like some of the ideas that, that, that Mr. Grant is talking about in terms of innovation. I think though that there is no substitute for engaged leadership to, to find leaders who will actually dig in and try to solve problems rather than sitting in their offices by themselves. Um, it's, it's great to have ideas bubble up, but somebody has, somebody has to be willing to grab them and implement them. And I think that, that asking the leaders who come before you for confirmation specifically about management challenges and challenging them to engage and to follow these issues through is perhaps the most important thing this committee can do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ms. Field? Well, I, I agree with Mr. Levine about the importance of sustained leadership at the top with a real focus on, on management. And I would also agree with his assessment uh, of the department compared to the private sector. Uh, I, I'm going to come back to the full financial audit. It's, it's not a, a silver bullet, but uh, if, if any major company CEO were sitting here before you and had not been able to, to pass a financial audit ever, uh, I, I think you would have a lot of questions about how well that, that company was run. So again, I think uh, for the department to continue the work toward uh, obtaining a, a clean opinion on the full financial audit is a really important part, not the only part, but a really important part of strengthening management at the department. Yeah, and we're actually doing that now. It's taken a few years, but it but will. we are. Yeah. Uh, uh, let's see, Dr. Grant. Well, as a social scientist, I don't have the data to quantify how far behind we are, but <laughs> it's far, uh, and it's, it's deeply distressing. I think the, the place that I would probably start is to build a leadership and management training program. Um, I, this is obviously self-serving since I live in a university, but we run these programs all the time uh, for both public sector and private sector leaders. And I think that there's a lot more that could be done to bring both DOD and private sector leaders together in these programs to compare notes and share effective practices. I think doing that, though, requires accountability. I think it requires accountability for leaders inside to implement the ideas that they learn from the outside. One of the ways that I've watched private sector organizations do this is through coaching. Uh, I've been struck that, that an increasing number of CEOs in the private sector uh, actually have an executive coach. Sometimes entire leadership teams have executive coaches. And we expect this of our elite athletes and musicians. We know they can't achieve excellence on their own. For some reason, when people get into leadership roles in organizations, we assume that they're, they're all good independently. So I would, I would love to see a little bit more feedback for senior leaders to find out, are they implementing the practices that we ultimately teach them? Yeah. Noticed in one of, your, uh, one of your articles, let me just read the quote here, it said, Many managers fear that when their employees spend lots of time coming up with new ideas, they will be less focused and efficient. Explain to me what you're talking about there. I think there's a, there's a false dichotomy that gets created in, in too many leaders' minds between creativity and execution. And the thought is that if we distract people by letting them generate ideas, that they're going to fail to implement them. The reality is we all have ideas all the time, right? Some of you have had, even had ideas for how to structure this meeting more efficiently. Um, and I think what we need to do is give people an outlet for those ideas and give them a chance to test them and express them and figure out if they're any good. <laughs> good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Senator North. Let me recognize Senator Shaheen, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to each of you for your testimony this morning. Ms. Field, I'd like to begin with you because I understand that there's still a government-wide personnel security process um, that faces a backlog in clearances and that that affects our ability to hire um, some of the most talented and qualified personnel that we would like to hire in DOD. That's unlike this committee where many of us have members who have security clearances who can't get in to hear classified information. But I digress on that. Um, so my question is, is that the case? Has it improved since background investigation got transferred from the Office of Personnel Management to DOD? And what do we need to do to ensure that we can address those security clearances and hire the people we want? 
and put them in the jobs that we want. Uh, thank you, Senator Shaheen. And as I'm sure you're aware, uh, the government personnel security clearance process is on our high risk list because of uh, the, the critical issues that you just identified. I think it is fair to say uh, that there has been some progress made. For example, most recently in our high risk report, we noted that DOD has made progress developing NBIS as a secure shared service for background investigations. That's one example of progress that has been made. Uh, but I will note that this chapter of the high risk report has one of the longest what remains to be done sections that I have seen in the high risk report. So uh, just to give you a, a few examples of some of those actions, uh, we, DOD needs to develop and implement a comprehensive strategic workforce plan that identifies the workforce needed to meet the cur current and future demand for its services. So I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but so is that something that DOD needs to be directed to do? Do we need to provide more resources for DOD? What, what are the impediments? Are they cultural, as you all have suggested in many cases? Well, I think, uh, and I'm not an expert on this, I should note, but I, I think one of the uh, impediments here to developing a comprehensive strategic workforce plan, in addition to just uh, having the impetus to do it, it comes back to data. So the department does not always know uh, what its skills are that it has, how many people it has that, ha that, have, that have those skills, and then what it needs, so what's the gap? Uh, and data is a key piece of that. That's where personnel management systems are so important. Well, so let me go back to you, Mr. Levine, because you talked about this in your statement. And over the years, this committee has authorized billions of dollars to address data management within the Department of Defense, and yet we still have these problems. So again, what's, what's the issue here? Are we hiring the wrong people? Do we not um, know what we need? Uh, Senator, um this is, this, is, this is where I make myself unpopular. I actually uh, disagree with GAO on the issue of the financial audit, and it goes to the question that you're talking about. This committee has authorized billions of dollars for data systems. To my lights, too much of that, too much of that investment has focused on financial statements and financial systems, and not enough has focused on the systems the department really needs to make it work the personnel data systems, the acquisition data systems, the logistics data systems. And one of the reasons you have trouble with the defense audit is those financial systems rely on all those other parts of the department which are actually doing the work and bring, and so if their systems, if you don't have good personnel, personnel systems, you're not, gonna, you're not gonna be able to audit in the end. Um, I would like to see the aperture broadened as to where the committee and the Congress and the department invest their money in data systems and a greater focus on, the, on what I consider the actual workhorse systems, those personnel systems, acquisition systems, logistics systems, so we get better data for management decisions where the rubber really hits the road. I think in spite of the criticism we get for, for lack of auditability, the, the financial systems are actually in relatively good shape compared to some, some of these other systems that have not gotten as much focus. Thank you. Um, Mr. Grant, I want to just share a story. Senator King and I visited the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard with Acting Secretary Hark not too long ago. And one of the demonstrations we saw was done by the shipyard's innovation project team led by Superintendent Joe Murphy. And it was an amazing display of creativity and innovation done by workers at the shipyard to improve how they address overhauls of submarines. And I, I would bet Senator King would agree with me that this was one of the most impressive things that we've seen. And that was the result of a culture at the shipyard, I believe, that responded to some of the threats about whether they were gonna be closed and developed a real um, culture, as I say, of um, management and workers working together to figure out how they could be more efficient and more productive. Now, I don't know how we create that system-wide, but certainly that's an example of what happens when people are given the leeway to actually innovate and do what they need to improve how they do their jobs. Senator, that sounds like the kind of example that we need to find and celebrate, and especially celebrate when senators are not watching. Thank you, Senator Shaheen. Senator Ernst. 
Thank you. And I appreciate our witnesses being here today. And, and Dr. Grant, I, I have to say, when you were talking about um, people saying things are too risky, you know, to, to do, um, we hear that all the time. And one of the mission command principles in the United States Army is to assume prudent risk. Um, so we really need to focus on that uh, much more. It's actually one of my four core uh, pillars of success. I actually have it on my challenge coins. Um, so I, I zoomed right into that, and I appreciate you sharing that because I do think we have to be innovative and accept, be willing to accept some of that risk to move forward. You know, identify the pros and cons of every situation, but be willing to take a step outside of the norm in order to get ahead. So I really, really appreciate that. And all of the input today is, is fascinating to me because um, I'm a former county auditor. Um, I know that's much smaller in rural Iowa, but um, I, I appreciate the input as well, Mr. Levine, on the, the fact that we're very focused on the, the financial systems, but you're right, there are so many other aspects that need to be pulled into all of that to, in order to complete that audit and uh, really present that to the American people. Um, so I do, I do wanna talk about the audit a little bit. And Ms. Field, you had a, a comment about uh, why it's important to do the audit. You, I believe you said it's a catalyst. And could you explain that a little bit further? Why is it important that we have that catalyst? Why is it important that we're able to pull all these pieces together? Well, thank you. Um, to, to borrow a phrase from Mr. Levine, uh, there are workhorse systems that are critical to key functions of the department related to things like personnel and real estate, uh, inventory, supply chain management. The full financial audit uh, is a forcing function for the department to make sure that those workhorse systems are operating effectively because they feed into the financial audit. So if those systems aren't in good shape, the department will never pass the full financial audit. What I think is uh, a good news story here in part is that uh, in the past three fiscal years through the full financial audit that the department has been conducting, although it hasn't passed, there have already been some concrete benefits that we've seen from the full financial audit. Uh, so for example, uh, the department engaged in inventory cleanup initiatives in order to prepare for the full financial audit. And that identified almost $3 billion in materials that could be used for redeployment. That has a direct link to readiness. Uh, I could go on and on, but um, I know that if the, the Comptroller General were sitting here today, he would also uh, forcefully speak for the importance of the full financial audit. Mm -hmm. No, and, and thank you, and I, I do agree with that, and I think it is important that we are able to pull as many of those pieces in and uh, continue to, to reinforce that. Even if we're not getting a clean audit, it is important that we continue to go through this exercise to pull all those pieces in, maybe um, take the funds and invest a little more in, in other systems. Um, because, as uh, Dr. Grant had stated about uh, executive coaches, uh, a lot of us have executive coaches that are called constituents. And it's really important that we're reporting back to our constituents that their taxpayer dollars are being used wisely and they are being directed to the resources that um, will show results, whether that's resourcing for our soldiers or Marines out in the field or whether it's within the systems at the, at the Pentagon or at the DOD. Um, and then finally, Mr. Grant, um, I know that we have identified a number of legacy programs and challenges that continue to exist year after year. Every year they're identified as challenges to the DOD. What can we do to overcome that just in the remaining few seconds? I'm, I'm not sure I know. I'm not an expert on the inner workings of the DOD and the, the legacy programs. I would say though that we're in a position where we do need to change the way that the department thinks about risk. I think that never taking a risk is actually a risky strategy. Um, and one of the things that I often find myself telling leaders is, if you think about investing in the stock market, you want a diversified portfolio. Right? You want some gambles, you also want some very safe, predictable investments. Our programs ought to work the same way. We ought to have a portfolio of risk where we have safe, predictable bets and we also have more uncertain bets. And it seems that we're not doing enough of the latter. 
Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all so much. I love all of the input uh, that you all have provided today. And thank you, Mr. Chair, for focusing on this issue. Thank you, Senator Ernst. And now via WebEx, uh, Senator Gillibrand. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about um, authorities for hiring. Um, Dr. Grant, I'll start with you. Uh, one issue that I'm really interested in is recruiting and retaining the most talented workforce that we can get access to, specifically in cyber. Um, uh, I had a hearing uh, on our subcommittee where we talked about um, getting the best cyber workforce and what authorities the DOD needed to um, be able to acquire the workforce that we needed. And there's one program called the Cyber Accepted Service. I don't know if you've read about it or know anything about it, and perhaps the other panelists might, um, but that created flexibility in allowing to hire the staff they wanted, um, different requirements, because not everybody who's expert in cyber are gonna necessarily look like or wanna be trained like a typical recruit for the armed services. Um, so we might need different standards for, um, uh, you know, how, how they're trained and whether they're going to have the same training in terms of um, fitness or in terms of um, weapons usage, uh, et cetera. Do you, do you have any uh, insights on this? And do you think um, that it would help to create flexible standards in order to recruit the most talented cyber personnel? I do, Senator Gillibrand. I think this was a high priority issue when we were doing our work on the DIB. I think we need to go further than, than higher standards. I actually think we need an entirely different career track for specialists. Uh, we already have one in the military for doctors and lawyers. I think it's time that we create one for computer scientists. Right? Most of our, our cyber expertise is gonna come from software engineers. And the sad reality we've seen in too many parts of the DOD is that you get rotated into a role for two years, you've just begun to develop expertise, and then you're forced out of it before you can fully master the skills that you're trying to train in. So I think if we created an expert specialist track for computer scientists, we'd have a much easier time not only attracting and retaining cyber talent, but also developing them. Other panelists, would you like to answer the same question? Senator, if I could, uh, first, it's good to see you again. Um, and uh, second, I, I, I appreciate your pointing to the Cyber accept, Accepted Service. I think it's an important tool. I think direct hiring authorities is, is, is an important tool as well. Those both focus on the civilian workforce. And then you asked about the military workforce. I think we have a real problem, which goes directly to what uh, Mr. Grant is talking about, in that we don't have a well-developed requirement within the military service within the military services of what we need. They have, they don't have, because they don't have a career track, they, uh, they don't have a specialty in cyber, uh, they, they, they don't have all the specialties they need to find, they can't send, to the, send a requirement to the recruiters. Um, what I think the key starting point is for our cyber is what is the requirement? How many people do we need? What kind of people? To the extent that they're military, why do we need to have them in the military rather than having civilians or contractors? So there may be different skills that we need from people who are in the military at one level, from people who are in the civilian at, one, at, at another level, and people that we contract out. And until we define what that is, it's kind of hard to, it's kind of hard to get on top of the recruiting problem, uh, problem because you don't know what requirement to send to your recruiters until you've gotten your arms around it and said, this is what I'm looking for. Uh, Ms. Field, do you have anything you want to say? Uh, the only thing I would add is, uh, and it's very much consistent with what Mr. Levine said, which is that uh, we, we see a lot of room for improvement at the department in terms of strategic workforce planning, uh, human capital and strategic approach to human capital is also on our high risk list. I should note that DOD has more areas in the high risk report than any other agency. Uh, but we also have developed some key principles for strategic workforce planning uh, that we would hope the department would follow, including determining the critical skills and competencies that will be needed to achieve current and future programmatic results uh, and developing strategies that are tailored to address gaps in number, deployment, and alignment of human capital approaches. There are more elements to those leading practices, uh, but having that framework in place could help the department think about things like uh, recruiting and retaining staff with cyber capabilities. Can you speak to the um, specific uh, idea that Dr. Grant shared in his answer? Uh, in terms of a specialty track? 
Correct. Like, do you think we could create within the DOD a specialty track with enumerated uh, requirements and that actually uh, allows for the flexibility that we created in the cyber accepted service? Uh, I, I am not an expert in human capital at the department. Based on what I know, I don't see any impediments to the department doing that. Uh, I think what I am suggesting is that in doing so, the department think about it holistically in terms of its workforce uh, planning efforts. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator Gillibrand. Let me now recognize via WebEx Senator Tillis. Say again. Tom, Senator, you're still on mute. We can't hear you. Senator Tillis, uh, you're recognized by WebEx. I think you might be on mute and we cannot hear you. Who's next? Uh, Senator Tuberville, are you ready, sir? This is unusual. You're so early in the uh, hearing. It is unusual. I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. You're very welcome. Your Thank patience you. has finally been rewarded. Thank you. It's always good to be here, right? Uh, Thank you very much for being here today. Dr. Grant, I was very encouraged by your uh, early remarks about, about the culture and about, uh, you know, 1950s management style. Hey, we got to grow. I mean, the Department of Defense is one, is the most important department we have in this country because if we're not safe and with the threats that we have, we're going to have huge problems. So thanks for your your expertise there and kind of understanding that, hey, if you got a, an idea, bring it up, and you're not jeopardized if you do that. I think that's so important. That's our culture today, and we have so many good ideas and great ideas. It's important to, to understand that. So... Uh, Ms. Fields, I, you know, we're proud that Redstone Arsenal has been selected as the permanent home for Space Command. And uh, the move is pending as an Inspector General review, which I'm confident will show the process through the, that, that, that it's the right choice. But last week during the Spacecom posture hearing, uh, my colleague brought up an important point regarding the significant cost savings of locating Space Command in Alabama. You know, the Air Force reported that the cost savings in moving Spacecom from Colorado to Redstone Arsenal in Huntsville is significant. Uh, a tremendous savings for the taxpayer, 35% one-time savings for the move, and then 25% annual cost savings over 20 years. This is all on top of the lowest cost of living and lowest cost index for construction and sustainment uh, out of all the considered sites. Now I'm asking, I'm not asking you to comment on the ongoing investigation, but I got one question. What options may exist to provide greater transparency into funding for combatant command operations, hiring and training and exercise all over the world? Uh, I want to make sure that I am understanding your question yeah. correctly. So uh, do you mind repeating the, la the very last piece of it? Yeah, well, you know, just kind of comment on, on hiring uh, for right positions in the DOD. Well, how important it is to not hire people just for what they went to school on, but the experiences that they have and what they bring, you know, to, to the game, so to speak. Uh, certainly. So uh, I, I believe you're, you're speaking about the civilian ac acquisition workforce. Is, is that? Yes, is that, yes. Um, thank you. Uh, so this is another uh, somewhat of, of a good news story. Um, DOD contracting has been on our high-risk list for, for many years, but we recently removed the section related to civilian acquisition workforce. As you, I'm sure, are aware, back in the 1990s, there were significant cuts to the civilian acquisition workforce. They had a lot of unintended consequences, and it took many years for the department to rebuild uh, that, that workforce. It, it is now in a much better place. Uh, and so uh, we were able to remove that portion from our, our high-risk list. So I think if I were to give you a, a sort of a status update today for, from the department on that, that would be a, a good news story. Thank you. Dr. Grant, as a professor at one of the world's top business schools, in your experience, how many of your students would consider a career in the Department of Defense when all that money's out there? Uh, you know, they can go out there and, 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 and bring in the bacon, so to speak. Uh, you know. What should we do to make the department more attractive 
you know, to kids coming out, you know, to to work, you know, for our country. Well, Senator, I've I've taught a I guess a few thousand students at Wharton over the past decade. I can count three who expressed an active interest in DOD, so it's not zero. Uh, what can we do to make it more attractive? I think the first thing we could do is create a rotational program where if you have technical talent in particular, if you have cyber capabilities, you can spend a year here, right, and then rotate back into the private sector. I'd love to have exchange programs with companies as well that would draw some of those, those people for six months or a year or two years at a time. With, and I think if we allowed them to rent their skills, they would be very excited about the opportunity to serve the mission without having to give up on their career aspirations altogether. It's important that we attract the best, you know, and I know they don't make as much money sometimes, but sometimes there's a sacrifice. Dr. Levine, several weeks ago, we heard from the Selective Service that out of 32 million young people uh, every year that sign up for Selective Service, only 450,000 were fit for the military and the DOD, 450,000 out of 32 million. The department faces a moral crisis of drugs, dropouts, arrests, and obesity in American youth governments. Uh, government can't uh, parent. What can we do to help turn this crisis around? I believe the statistic you're looking at also encompass the issue of what's called propensity, whether whether young people are inclined toward military service. Right. So there's 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 the fitness issue, there's also the propensity issue. The fitness issue is very difficult because it goes to society as a whole and, and you have to deal with, with the fitness of, of our young people in general. The propensity issue may be a little bit a little bit more in the in the area that Congress and and the uh, and the and the department can directly address. Um, by communicating the mission of the importance of, of, of service to service to country and 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 the value that the military is, that, that the military provides to the country, I think that that message has been lost over the years, and 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 that there's a large segment of our society that doesn't believe that the military is important and doesn't even consider or think about military service for that reason. I think that's a place where Congress can help. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Tuberville. Now let me recognize Senator Kane, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Ranking Member Hanoff, and to the witnesses. It's great to have you here today. Um, I'll, I think I'll start with you, uh, Mr. Levine. We did a across uh, the board headquarters cut as part of the 2017 NDAA, and I was pretty significantly opposed to that at the time, not because I opposed cuts, but because I had done so much budget cutting as governor during the 0809 fiscal recession that I that I learned across the board cuts were problematic. Two years later, we were dealing with a crisis in military housing, <clears throat> and questions at hearings in December 2019 revealed that because of the headquarters cut, the Army had laid off 33 percent of their housing oversight staff. The, the Air Force had laid off 76 housing oversight staffers. The Navy number was a little bit harder to determine. Um, across the board cuts just are not the way to run any operation. But we do need to push efficiencies. We do need to look at letting go of lesser performing programs, if only to then repurpose those resources into more new innovation or higher performing programs. So where within DOD should the kind of continuous improvement be pushed? Should it be at the service secretary level reporting to the SECDEF or what's the organizational, um, best organizational place to have this kind of push so we don't do across the boards, which are foolish, but we do targeted strategies? So first, um, I was in the position of having to implement some of those cuts when you did enact them, so I, I, I shared your pain on that um, and, and saw some of, the, uh, some of the difficult decisions that had to be made. Um, and let me just give you a couple of other examples before I talk about how you address it. Um, we talked about strategic workforce planning and the need for strategic workforce planning in a number of areas today. One of the reasons why the department is really bad at strategic workforce planning is it doesn't have any workforce to do strategic workforce planning. That would be a headquarters function and we've defunded it. We don't have that capability. Um, one, that, one that particularly worries me is modeling and simulation where we spend much less on modeling and simulation. If you wanna be innovative and experiment and, and, and experimental, you ought to be spending more on modeling and simulation, not less. So you, you can sort of go down a list and see things that have been cut that, yeah, that's a headquarters reduction, but it makes a real difference for the ability to, of, of the military to operate. It makes a difference for the warfighter. Um, I, I have to be careful, though, in saying that, that, that 
the budget is a blunt edge tool but it's an important tool because it really is true that in the department of defense if you just tell people to do things better you will never see any savings on anything so it's important that you I, I would i have a real problem with these kinds of across the board cuts that are unrealistically deep in particular um, they 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 push the department into into behavior that doesn't make sense you have stuff that's cut in one place um, civilians are cut and you end up with military doing the same function and doing it more expensively. Or uh, OSD is cut and you end up with, with three military departments doing the same thing and duplicating efforts and doing it more expensively. So you, you end up with, 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 cuts, with, with cuts that end up costing you more than they save you. But if you don't have some use of the budget to, to, to drive toward, toward efficiency in, in, in those areas, you're not going to get it. Um, so I would say that, that more rational targeted cuts where you specifically looked at an area and said, um, this is an area which is, I know I'm going to need to do it, but I need to, be, I need to do it better. Um, I'm not going to cut you in the first year because I need you to do, do the planning that it takes to figure out how you're going to do it better. And I'm going to target this area. And I'm saying, you're going to get 2% or 4%, but over a period of time to let you phase it in and figure out how to make your processes work better, then you can use the budget as a tool in a way that makes more sense instead of this cross the board thing that, that's just going to hurt as much as it helps. Um, Mr. Lean, I got one more question for you. All of you indicate the importance of leadership to making all any of these things work. And I, I'm a little worried about the uh, prevalence during the last administration and then still today with actings rather than confirms. So right now, I think there are 60 Senate confirmed positions in the DOD, 20 are confirmed, um, two thirds have acting in the role and that certainly is a holdover from the past administration. What are the downsides of ha having huge swaths of the leadership be acting rather than uh, you know, in place with the confidence that they can have the job for a while? So, Senator, just quickly, first, first, um, a transition between administrations is always a difficult time, and you can expect to have actings in, in much greater numbers just, just because of the nature of that, of that period of time. Um, the downside to actings is that the bureaucracy and, 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 and the organization don't pay as much heed to actings as they do to full-time confirmed officials. There's, there's a level of, of ability to do things that, that becomes greater, uh, the ability to work with senior people in the, in the building. Remember that the senior military are all there. So you have your four stars. Is the four star dealing with somebody who is a real peer, who is a Senate confirmed peer, or is the, is the four star dealing with somebody that they know is an SES who's temporarily sitting in that seat and will be gone tomorrow? It, it really does affect the ability to, to act on management issues. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Kane. And let me uh, recognize Senator Tillis by a WebEx with the assumption the technology is working. Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? I can, Senator. Thank you. Thank goodness I have technical skills to actually undo what this application randomly did to me for muting. Uh, Mr. Grant, you missed an incredible question that I, I was on mute. I want to go back and see if I can uh, redo it. Um, I spent most of my career in technology research and development and large-scale technology implementation and your concept of stretching the team to come up with ideas, some of them didn't make sense, many of them did, I think is very important. In fact, we brought it up in a uh, subcommittee hearing with us, uh, Chair Gillibrand just last week. How, how would we structurally do that within the Department of Defense or create that culture? What sort of suggestions you would, would you have for maybe baby steps to uh, get that sort of culture of innovation ingrained in everyone and, and possibly even encourage them through financial incentives if they complete their day job, but come up with great ideas that are that potentially uh, uh, can be uh, either complementary to the, the mission set that they have or to maybe some other area within the Department of Defense. Senator, one practice I've seen in the private sector is to rethink the idea of the suggestion box and say suggestions are great, but first we need problems. We need to figure out which problems need to be solved. Uh, I'd love to see problem boxes in every single segment of the DOD, uh, where anytime you see something broken, it could be a technical bug, it could be a management bug or a culture bug, you submit it. Then we get senior leaders to come in and rate how important the various problems are. And then if you want to work on one of the high priority problems, you can get some resources to do that. You can build a team around you. I think that's one way to begin the innovation process. 
I think in order for that to be sustainable, of course, we need senior leaders who are willing to place bets on some of those ideas. Uh, but the great, uh, the great thing about raising problems is if you do it effectively, you can actually build consensus about what the issues are before we then have to innovate around finding the best solution to them. And I think that's a process that would make it a lot easier for people who are on the ground closest to the action uh, to, to point out the things that senior leaders need to be aware of. So personally, I might start there. Uh, they, I think that's a great idea. Um, uh, Mr. Levine or Ms. Fields, I, um, I, I want to go back to a, a question that uh, Senator Shaheen touched on and uh, Senator Gillibrand, and that has to do with we're in a highly competitive environment where most people with really hot skills probably have two or three job offers pending at the same time. And then you get a job offer from the Department of Defense and they tell you it could be months before they can onboard you. What more do we need to do to really accelerate that process? We, we talked about things that we could do for non-classified office space for hirees pending their clearance, but what more do we need to do to be competitive? I, I think we can attract people to the DOD because of the tools and the mission, but we create a huge impediment when it could be six or nine months before you can be onboarded. Uh, thoughts on that? Senator, you've done a lot to address that with the uh, direct hiring authority that you've already provided. I think you correctly point to the security clearance process as something that's a continuing bottleneck there. I would point out, though, the security clearance process is a bottleneck for many parts of the private sector, too, with, at least if they're working for the Department of Defense. To me, the most important thing you can do in this area, there, there are two things. One is, I mentioned before, is, is, is identify your requirements. Figure out what parts of that cyber workforce you need to have in uniform, what parts you need to have as employees, and what parts you can contract out, because you have greater tools and greater flexibility if you can contract out. And sometimes you can bring in, in better talent. But where you need to bring the workforce in-house, where you want to hire civilians, comes to my second point, the most important thing is you can invest in the civilians and show them that you care about them while they're, while they're in the department. So don't just hire and forget. Um, bring them in, train them up, give them, give them, give them a kind of, of, of educational experience, rotational experience, so that they're exposed to the mission, know that they're important to the mission and the department cares about them. That, that to me, is the most important thing you can do in terms of making the department a more attractive employer. Ms. Fields, in, in uh, my remaining time, uh, the 2019 GAO, uh, GAO report that identified more than 100 initiatives that were intended to improve business operations within the DOD were never really acted on. Can you, uh, do you have um, uh, an understanding of some of those initiatives and the ones that you think really should have been implemented that could have potentially improve business operations within the DOD? Well, I want to make sure that I'm responding to the correct <laughs> correct report. I, it, we do have a high-risk area focused on DOD's approach to business transformation where we talk about sort of the overarching structure uh, that the department needs. Uh, but we also talk about business systems modernization. Uh, and one of the key areas there is in an in a effort to um, come up with a plan for the next generation of the federated business uh, enterprise, uh, enterprise business architecture uh, which is about uh, mapping sort of the framework for business transformation. So mapping all of the different business systems that the department has in place that are needed to drive management reform. Uh, that initiative is one of the, the key uh, plans that the department needs to fully implement. I agree, uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. I, I just, I, I think that we're not looking, there, there are two distinct functions within the DOD. There's the warfighter and protecting our national security working with our partners and allies, and there's the business of the DOD that hasn't been modernized by any contemporary standards for uh, decades. And I think that we need to look at that to, to as fundamental as an application portfolio, uh, inventory of all applications and systems across the DOD, which ones can be consolidated, modernized, and drive out efficiencies that we can plow into these very important underfunded initiatives within the DOD. So hopefully, uh, Mr. Chair, Thank you for bringing this topic up for a committee hearing. Hopefully we can see some progress over this Congress. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator Tillis. Uh, let me now recognize Senator King. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think the most uttered sentence in America in the last 12 months has been, you're still on mute. 
Uh, we all hear that. Uh, Mr. Levine, I want to ask a policy question disguised as a management question. Jack Welsh once said management was looking reality in the eye and then doing something about it. My concern is that the reality is, in terms of the defense of this nation, that the most serious and likely threat is in cyber. Anybody who thinks about a future conflict will, will assert that it will at least begin with a cyber attack uh, on our military systems, on our electric grid, financial systems, all of those things. And that may be the, the extent of the, of the war. I just did a quick calculation based upon the 2021 budget. We're spending a little over 2% of the defense budget on cyber. Are we making a huge management error by not recognizing the uh, significant threat uh, and not reflecting it in our budgetary priorities? Well, Senator, you spent uh, several months now, I gather, with the Cyber Solarium Commission, so I'm afraid that I'm responding to somebody who knows a whole lot more about this subject than I do in terms of the balance. But uh, what, I would, what I would suggest that you, that you think about in framing the issue is, what is it possible to do? Is it, in fact, possible to create a cyber defense that's going to be effective within, even if you spent the entire defense budget on it? Could you do that, or is our reliance on the Internet and our reliance on computers so extensive and our investment so ex extensive. It, if, if we went from 2% of the budget from three to 3% to 5%, how much difference would it make? And, and do we need to think in different terms? Do we need to think in terms of, of d deterrence or offensive capabilities rather than simply in, in defensive capabilities? I don't know the answer to that question. I know that you've got a tremendously important question. I know you spent more time on it than I have. Um, but I, but I can't answer it. I, I, I can't tell you there's a magic percentage or a magic number that we could spend uh, that would make us safe in that area. I, I, and I agree with you. you. We cannot patch patch our way out of this risk. And I don't know whether the what the right number is, but I think 2% is low. On the other hand, you're absolutely right that deterrence has to be part of the equation. That's that's the, uh, that, the, the best cyber attack is the one that doesn't occur, and it doesn't occur because the adversary is afraid that there will be there will be response. Uh, 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 what I said to someone the other day is, this is a new this is deterrence 2.0, mutually assured disruption, uh, and that's really the, the way we need to think about it. Uh, I'm concerned about the lack of data, and your testimony from the GAO. One of my favorite sayings is, "Does it work?" and "How do you know?" It strikes me that we don't have a way of knowing in many cases. Is that, is that accurate? Uh, well, I think that the, the full financial audit, which I know I sound like a, a broken record, is one of the ways to figure out uh, what we know and what we don't know, and therefore which problems to prioritize. Uh, to bring it back to, to cybersecurity, uh, as a result of the full financial audit, DOD identified hundreds of vulnerabilities in its IT systems. Um, that provided a roadmap for uh, strengthening those IT systems from a cyber attack. So I agree with you, we, we don't have yet a full and complete picture of the department. The sad fact is the Russians may have a better idea of where those vulnerabilities are than, than we do, but that's, that's <laughs> another subject. Um, Mr. Levine, uh, this had been touched upon. It's always concerned me that turnover is a problem. The whole mindset in the military of the, th the three-year assignment and then move on uh, is a barrier to the development and maintenance of expertise and experience. Uh, should we be rethinking the, the sort of rotational uh, uh, mindset that, that drives so much of, of personnel policy in the Defense Department? Uh, Senator King, I, I would be cautious about that. What I would say is perhaps in some areas, so, for example, where you have an area where you feel you need deep expertise. Um, but the rotational uh, system in the military also provides us with value. It provides us um, with, with broad people, with, with broad leaders, leadership skills that you don't get otherwise, exposure to multiple kinds of problems, a different kind of thinking. And when, combined, when, when you combine the military and the civilian who are present next, present next to each other in some of these organizations, you have the civilians who can bring the continuity, the military who can bring the leadership, that can be a pretty potent combination. So I would say the answer is yes, but I heard Senator Ernst say earlier, um, what, what was it, uh, assume prudent risk? 
This is an area where I think you want to assume prudent risk. You want to test this in areas where you think it would be particularly helpful to, to build deep expertise before you in broaden fact, it. We, to we, have, we have a model for that in the nuclear Navy where the term is eight years as opposed to three years in other places because of the need for expertise. So I take your point that it should be done selectively, but there may be places where it would help. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator King. Let me recognize Senator Hawley, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks to the witnesses for being here. Mr. Levine, if I could just start with you. You wrote last year that the next Secretary of Defense should preserve the good elements of the new acquisition experimentation while avoiding a return to the 1990s era conspiracy of hope. I wonder if you could just elaborate on that for us. What, what aspects of acquisition form should DOD be focusing on and what pitfalls does it need? So, so um, I, I just quoted Senator Ernst saying, assume prudent risk. I think that's what we need to be doing in the acquisition system. And another way I've said it is, is we need to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. We need to be able to do far out experimental kinds of things. And at the same time, we need to be able to run major programs that are going to cost hundreds of billions of dollars in a, in, in a relatively controlled way so that they don't, so that, so that we don't end up having them have overruns of 50, 100% uh, as we have had with weapon systems in the past. The experience that we had in the 1990s was that um, we, we said, we're going to try new things and these new things are all going to work. And so we're going to we're going to assume that everything's going to work really well. We're going to put in we're, we're going to take off all the controls and that's going to reduce our costs. We took off controls. We took off baselines. We, we put in commercial technologies and commercial approaches. And when things didn't work, we had a cost that really spiraled out of control and a lot of weapon systems that failed, weapon systems that were canceled. Uh, the Army lost essentially a generation of modernization uh, because it, it, pl it plowed money into systems that didn't pan out. So. We need to be able to do some things in a conservative way, where we're really careful and cautious. But we, but uh, when you're when you're building an aircraft carrier, you probably you, w you probably want to be very careful about how you build the aircraft carrier, so that when you got it gets to the end of your twelve billion dollar investment, you have a twelve billion, a twelve billion dollar aircraft carrier. On the other hand, you want to be able to do this experimentation and and push the frontier. So it's walk and chew gum at the same time. Is what is, is what is what I'm suggesting here. Very good. Thank you. Thank you for that. Ms. Field, let me ask you about this. A GAO report from this year credited DOD leadership with demonstrating a strong commitment to improving the management of its weapon system weapon system uh, systems acquisitions. Uh, but the report went on to say that there's more work to be done. So l let me just ask you about that. Do any weapons programs in particular stand out to you as examples of the kinds of programs, of how these kinds of programs should be managed? Uh, so uh, I will first note that my, my colleague Shelby Oakley will be here next week to talk about acquisition reform, and she might be the best person to answer that question. Um, but I will say that uh, we did an analysis, I think, last year where we looked at different major defense acquisition programs. And one of the things we found is that for those programs where there were certain steps taken in the acquisition process, such as reviewing the designs at an earlier point in the process than traditionally done, they had significantly less cost overruns and schedule growth. And so um, the, which programs those exactly were, Ms. Ms. Oakley will know, um, but we certainly do have examples of, of acquisition programs that have been run uh, better than others. I would also know that the department has uh, instituted new policies to try to speed up the acquisition process. We think that those policies are a good step forward. What we now need to see are the military services uh, mirroring those policies with their own in-house policies. Let me ask you this. Uh, the department has long struggled to balance near-term and long-term requirements, and we've seen this play out in recent years as DOD has tried to meet the combatant commander's request for forces while also allowing the, serv the services uh, to pursue and rebuild readiness and modernization. Uh, how can better management practices help improve DOD's ability to manage these competing priorities in a systematic way? Well, that's a really, really tough question. And I think that the tension between uh, readiness and modernization is one that, that, that no single person can, can figure out. Um, I, I will say that the idea behind a chief management officer, which is something that we have, have long suggested the department needs, is to uh, elevate, integrate, institutionalize uh, management reform so that uh, the secretary and the deputy secretary can be freed up to focus on tough questions like that. So have a senior official whose full-time job is to try to improve uh, management processes to save money 
uh, to put toward things like readiness and modernization. So having a senior official who can focus full time on management reform is key. Do you have anything to add to that, Mr. Levine? Well, I, I, I would agree with Ms. Field that, that, that the balancing of readiness and, and future needs is, is, is a matter of bu budgets and priorities. It's really not a management issue. It's an issue more for the Secretary of Defense and for the Congress to, to, to reach that balance than, than for management level officials in the department. Very good. My time has nearly expired. I may have another question or two for you for the record, but uh, thank you so much, all of you, for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Hawley. Let me recognize Senator Kelly, please. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And um, this first question is for Mr. Levine. So you've, you've had a, uh, experience of serving in the senior management of both the Defense Department and the staff of the Senate Armed Services Committee. And some suggest Congress is like the board of directors uh, for DOD. Uh, based on your experience, can you speak about how you view the relative roles of the DOD and Congress? Congress, as I, as I said in my opening statement, Congress can set priorities for, for the department and Congress can, can provide tools to the department, but Congress cannot manage the department. So we're here today talking about defense management. There are things that you can do to help, but at the end of the day, it's DOD officials and senior positions who have to manage the organization. Um, the, the thing that, that I worry about is that, that when Congress tries too hard to help, it can be counterproductive. So, um, if we have too much legislation, even if it's well-intentioned legislation, it may even be good legislation, it can, it can add a huge burden to the department, which becomes more of a management problem than, 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 than the help. I don't know if that answers your question. Well, uh, Mr. Levine, as, as we look to improve accountability to the American public while improving readiness and deployment of new technologies, how should we work together to improve these management practices? So I, I think that... that Congress's best role in management is as a partner for, for leaders of the Department of Defense. So you can partner with them by, by meeting with them, getting to know them, understanding the problems they're working with, understanding whether they need new tools, and, set, and helping them set priorities. Um, you can push them, you can, you can provide oversight to them. What you can't do at the end of the day is manage, as I say, they have, they have to have that responsibility. But you can push them in the right directions. Thank you. Um, Dr. Grant. Uh, I was at NASA during the uh, Columbia Space Shuttle accident um, and on the ground there in East Texas uh, helping lead the recovery mission during those first uh, couple days. And I lost friends and classmates that day, and it was a difficult time for our organization. And this investigation um, after Columbia discovered that multiple employees uh, at NASA were concerned about the damage the space shuttle had taken during liftoff but had never raised those concerns. Um, and as we assess what happened and why, we opted to make management changes to avoid the kind of group think that helped lead to this disaster. To this day, on a wall in a conference room near the Mission Control Center, it says, uh, this is a quote, it says, none of us is as dumb as all of us. You know, the message being that few things are as dangerous in a high-stakes environment as unchallenged group think. Dr. Grant, the Department of Defense necessarily relies on a no-fail, can-do culture that places a premium on command and control structures to ensure the success of its missions. How can managers in DOD apply your research about the advantages of challenging groupthink to an organization like the Department of Defense? Senator, how many hours do you have today? Uh, I think this is, it's obviously a very complex question, and frankly, I think there's a lot we can learn from NASA that's applicable to DOD. Uh, I think the place I would start is, I know one of the norms in place at NASA now and in many parts of the organization is that uh, at the very end of a meeting, people are asked, does anyone have any information that hasn't been shared but might be relevant to the decision we're making today? Uh, I think it's a last-ditch attempt for people to share critical information that might have gotten lost. I think that we need to think, though, much more systematically about how we encourage people to challenge upward. One of the things I worry about most is sometimes known as the HIPPO effect. Uh, HIPPO stands for highest paid person's opinion. And as soon as that's known, people want to jump on the bandwagon. We start to see conformity and convergent thinking instead of diversity of thought and divergent thinking. 
Uh, I think that you know, there are a lot of different ways to challenge that, but one of the ways that we implement this in many organizations is we say, okay, let's put the problem or the decision on the table. Let's get everybody's independent thought before the leader's views are known. And that way we can surface the, the different opinions in the room and begin to discuss which ones are worth pursuing. I think that's a practice we could probably, excuse me, probably apply much more broadly than we currently do. Yeah, I used to, um, when I would got assigned to be a commander of a mission, one of the first things I'd tell my crew members is that they were required to question my decisions, not optional, um, especially if it had to do with safety and mission, mission success. I mean, there's some things that could go, but when it has to do with those two things, safety and mission, mission success, we need individuals that'll question their leadership. Yeah, so yeah let's, let's make it unsafe not to speak up. Thank you, Dr. Grant. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Kelly. Let me recognize Senator Sullivan, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I uh, appreciate the witnesses coming today. Really important topic, even though it's kind of dense. So, Mr. Levine, let me, um, I was reading your 10 rules for defense management reform, and I want to look at one of your rules. You, you list, uh, you caution Congress and the DOD from taking on too much. You list a number of recent major overhauls to include military health care, defense acquisition, officer personnel management, military retirement, UCMJ, and you conclude by stating, when you try to attack everything at once, you often end up accomplishing nothing. So if this committee were going to take your sound advice, given the current strategic environment, where should we focus defense reform efforts to ensure we compete most effectively with China and Russia, and we get back to the main mission of the Department of Defense. There's been a lot of talk about some of these, uh, you know, broader issues, social issues, you might want to call them, but I think we have to remember the DOD mission is to protect our nation, to close with and destroy the enemies of our country, if need be, to go and kill the enemies of our country. And sometimes we forget that. What are the reforms you would focus on? So first, Senator, I, I, my, my rules are a little bit oversimplified. So I'm, I'm talking about rules that you can prioritize so you get them up at the senior level of the department and you get your senior, senior leaders to focus on them, which can only be a handful. I would, I would focus, I would, I would think about a couple of areas. Um, one is, um, one is the area that, that um, sort of the advanced kinds of skills that we need for new war fighting, whether it's cyber, AI, software, those are things that we are increasingly reliant on and we're deficient in skills. And, and I would look at that as being a major priority for the Department of Defense. We need to reform the way, we, we need to reform the way that we access those skills and the way we treat those skills so that we can build them into the workforce and, 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 and make better use of them. The second thing I would worry about is, is, is data. Um, we've got reams and reams of data in the Department of Defense. We've got all kinds of data that could be incredibly helpful to us, and we're not able to access it in an effective way to make decisions. Mm -hmm. I think that those two things would be right up at the top of my priority list, Senator. Okay. Let me, and I'm going to uh, ask this question for all three uh, witnesses, and I know you've already talked about it, but it's such an important issue, and I think it's such a um, strategic disadvantage relative to China in particular, but it doesn't need to be. And that's in the area of um, weapons systems reform, uh, getting new platforms. Uh, we've all heard the, uh, the kind of parade of horrible Senator Tillis. I'm, not, I'm, I'm surprised that he didn't pull out his 450-page uh, RFP for the next pistol, literally, a 450-page RFP for the next generation of a handgun. I mean, you can go and buy a handgun off the shelf that I think would be fine, whether it's the F-35 taking 20 years to develop. I know we've already talked about the Ford-class carrier. But then you have other instances in U.S. history. I forgot the development time frame of the SR-71, the Blackbird, the spy plane, but I, I know it was very, very short. 
So what can we do to address the giant challenges that we have in developing weapon systems that take years, if not decades, and certainly disadvantages us relative to China? I, I think one of the key things that needs to happen uh, is, is to get out of the, the business of uh, bringing on or starting new acquisition programs without having sound business cases in place from the beginning. And so we often see uh, in acquisition that the requirements simply don't match the resources. It's a fundamental problem. I'm, I'm oversimplifying it, but that is, that is a key piece of it. Uh, and the result, of course, is that more programs are started than can be executed. Buying power is reduced. Performance is re reduced. Delivery is delayed. And so bringing uh, a more discipline to the upfront piece of the acquisition process is critical. Great. Any other witnesses on that? Senator, I think that recognizing that different markets are different, that acquisition is not all of one piece. So the example you gave of, of handguns is obviously a crazy thing uh, because handguns are out there. There's no, there's no revolutionary handgun that the Department of Defense is going to invent that, that's, that's vastly superior to what the commercial marketplace is producing. Aircraft carriers are different from handguns. Uh, it probably takes 10, 15, 20 years to, to field your next aircraft carrier, and you're not going to short circuit that by running a, a competition faster or something because it, that's the development cycle. Um, software is completely different because it's largely commercial. We need to be able to respond to the, each, each of these areas in different ways depending on what the market is and what the competitors look like. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Sullivan. Uh, let me now recognize via WebEx Senator Manchin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here and the service you've given our country. Uh, Mr. Levine, my home state of West Virginia sits just outside of the national capital region, which is often used in the Fed's contract as a way to geographically limit which companies can compete for the work of the Department of Defense. This is known as place of performance. A clause has been a hindrance to West Virginia and a number of other rural states without a significant military or industrial footprint, essentially preventing any company, any opportunity at increasing that footprint for business that don't exist in the region identified by the place of performance clause. And my question would be, would you agree that there's need for a change? And if it would be basically still hurting the department if we don't change it uh, in the highly urban and high cost of living areas that is a strain anyway, I have to assume that the higher cost is being passed on uh, to the department and the taxpayers. So your comments on this would be appreciated. Well, so Senator, first of all, it's good to see you again. Um, you second too. of all, uh, I think that it, it, as I just was saying in, in response to Senator, uh, Senator Sullivan, it would depend on the market. So there's some things where, per, where place of performance may be important. I would think those would be fairly limited. Uh, something where you have to support an organization that is in the national capital region. And even that may be more attenuated these days as we're all getting used to remote work. So things that we thought in past years we needed to have a place of performance that was, that was close to uh, the, the organization or entity that was, that, that was in charge, uh, we may now, with, with, with our greater ability to work remotely, be able to move on from that. And I think it's something that deserves to re be reexamined. Are we using that? Correctly, there may there are probably still some places where we need to specify place of yeah. performance, uh, but it may be less today than it was even a year ago. Is it a policy in place, sir, or do you have the flexibility to make those changes or recommendations, or does it take legislation? Uh, I believe that the that the executive branch would have the ability to make that 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 change on its own. I don't believe that any legislation is required with regard to place of performance on contracts. Right. If you could check that out, I really appreciate that. Uh, Ms. Field, I was extremely disappointed last year's NDAA included the termination of the chief management officer position at the DOD. In light of the DO, uh, CMO's position uh, termination, I asked my staff to get on the phone with a number of experts, including yourself and Mr. Levine, to talk about how Congress can help shape cost reform in the DOD, specifically in the fourth estate. One idea that was brought up by the multitude of people was the creation of another undersecretary of defense Role, uh, whose role would be similar to the State Department's Deputy Secretary for Management and Resources. My question would be, while I don't want to see more bureaucracy added to the DOD without appropriate authority driving it, are there any concrete ways that we can empower a position? 
within the department to ensure business reforms are instituted without constant oversight at the congressional level? Thank you for that question. Um, and you're, you're absolutely right. Since 2005, uh, GAO has, has noted the need for a very senior official at the Department to drive management reform. It was the same year we added DOD's approach to business transformation to our high-risk list. There are a number of different structures that could be used uh, to help drive change at the department. Now, changing a line in an org chart is not going to, to get you where you need to be. Uh, but what we, we believe the department needs is a senior official who is in full-time position created through legislation, has the responsibility, authority, and accountability for DOD's overall business transformation efforts, reports directly to the Secretary of Defense, brings significant and relevant experience to the job, is on a term appointment crossing administrations, and is subject to a performance contract. That's what we called for back in 2005. I think the legislation back in FY17 and 18 through the NDAA that created the chief management officer was actually very much in line with a lot of that. Uh, unfortunately, what we found is that the department didn't truly empower the CMO with those authorities because they were subject to the direction, control, and authority of the Secretary Thank of Defense, who did not support the CMO. Thank you very much. Every business and economy runs an inherent risk of generating waste, but the clear difference here, in my opinion, is that the management of these vast programs of the DOD are not prioritized or incentivized with programs or audits that reinforce cutting waste. Furthermore, I feel as though waste in the DOD is far too often seen as an excuse as an excuse by product, and what troubles me is that the accepted normality is then passed off to the American taxpayer. So either one of you all, from a business reform perspective, what are the top concerns you have with the Defense Logistics Agency, the Defense Information uh, System Agency, the Defense Finance, uh, the Defense Contact Contract Audit Agency, and Defense Contract Management Agency? Senator, uh, so I would say that, that the Defense Logistics Agency, in my experience, is one of the best run parts of the Department of Defense. Um, I can't tell you there's no waste there, but it, but my impression is that it is extremely, it's extremely effective, effective and efficient, and that the consolidation of, of tasks that used to be performed in the military departments into a single agency uh, that, that runs them on a, consolidated base, on a consolidated basis for all the military departments has been, has, has been a success. Uh, DFAS is also uh, consumes far less resources than the services did when they performed similar functions. I think there are real questions now, though, about the interface between DFAS and the services as we try to get to financial audit, and whether sometimes that becomes more of a problem than than than, than a solution. Because we now, as as we field uh, these enter enterprise resource systems in the in the services, and and they're capable of doing some of the things that DFAS does. Uh, there may be some duplication there that causes more problem than it helps, and it's something that deserves to be looked at. Um, I give you one more, which is DISA. I think there's been some concern that DISA, DISA um, doesn't necessarily control all the all the all the all the, all the things that it would like to control, and there's there there rival there's rivalry with the services. There's there's some. Uh, duplication of, of, of computing centers, as I understand it, and computing capability within DISA. Um, some of that may be uh, because it's located in places in the United States where it's hard to close, hard to close a facility once you have it. Um, but these, these are not agencies that are waste. These are agencies that are an essential part of the way the department operates, not only its business systems, but also its warfighting systems. DLA, uh, and DISA in particular support the war fight and, and shouldn't be just viewed as, as overhead. Thank you very much. My time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Manchin. And now let me recognize via WebEx Senator Rosen. Uh, thank you, Chairman Reed, Ranking Member Inhofe, uh, for holding this important hearing. I'd like to thank all the witnesses uh, for being here testifying. Uh, today, because as you know, DOD's 2019 digital modernization strategy. It does serve as the department's strategic plan for information resource management and presents uh, IT related modernization goals. But I want to speak to uh, something a little more specific uh, common data capture across all platforms because raw data is a strategic asset. When data is common across platforms, it provides a powerful tool for policymakers for strategic planning, knowing what we did, what we need to do, et cetera. So DOD's modernization strategy calls for elevating the importance of data and information in its military operations. 
standardizing uh, data capture across DOD organizations. Some data capture can give the warfighter better information on efficiencies by using economies of scale, uh, maybe consolidating resources where it makes sense, uh, understanding what our needs or gaps are for future military operations. So to Ms. Field and Mr. Levine, as DOD modernizes, how should it attempt to convert and capture data that's common in some kind of common format across um, organizations for uh, strategic planning and operations? But one thing I would say is you can't do it on the cheap. Um, there's, there's often an effort to, to shortcut this and, and think we can do it with no resources. We absorb fantastic quantities of data in the Department of Defense, both for warfighting purposes and business purposes. I think I heard at some point that the F-35 alone takes in more data than the entire department took in in, in, in say, 1980 or 1985. I mean, just, vast quantities of data from, from a single system, and we don't even know, we don't know what to do with it. We don't know how to operationalize it. The same is true on the business side. It's not good enough just to take in the data. We've been, we, we, we've, too, for too long, we've, we've shortcutted through past, past the whole issue of data science. We need data science in the department. We need data scientists. We need to curate our data so that it's in a form that we can actually use it in. And that's not going to be, that's not going to be cheap and easy. Um, and that's why I talk about opening the aperture on our, on, our, um, on our financial audit investment and investing more in the other, data, other types of data and other types of data systems uh, where we have been really deficient in, in our investment. I, I couldn't agree more. Ms. Field, would you like to elaborate quickly? Because I have one more um, important question. Uh, very quickly, I will note that uh, uh, standardizing definitions of data is critical in order to draw connections and make comparisons and therefore better informed decisions. One thing I will note is that the, the chief management officer uh, before that position was eliminated worked with the CIO to develop an integrated business framework. That was a positive step toward exactly what you're talking about. And so one of the things that we plan to look at at GAO is what happened to that effort uh, now that the position has been eliminated. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'd like to move on to tech personnel management. This question's for Mr. Levine. In a recent article, you cited risk adverse personnel systems and you quote it, a maze of rules is undermining the Pentagon's ability to ac access the people it needs, and it is, quote, driving away needed talent. Uh, Senator Blackburn and I, we've been trying to address this challenge in cyber, uh, recently introducing legislation to create a cyber reserve for DOD and DHS made up of former federal personnel now working in the private sector, a reserve corps, if you will. So building on questions from Senators Gillibrand and Tillis, what do you believe are some of the management constraints that are keeping DOD from attracting talent in the fields of software, cyber, and artificial intelligence? And um, what can we do if, uh, to help you attract talent for these critical fields? So first of all, uh, just hearing about it from, from, from you, that the idea of a cyber reserve uh, sounds like a good idea. Um, it sounds like a good idea because we need to access talent wherever we can find it. So if we can, if we can access it, if we can tap into a different type of talent in a different way, uh, that's got to be a good thing. Uh, with regard to civilian employment, um, my view is uh, you know, you, we have direct hiring authority now. Congress has been very good about providing direct hiring authority in areas like cyber. Um, and so the, the, the uh, inefficiencies of the competitive hiring system really are not particularly a problem in, in an area like cyber. Um, the question of pay comes in. We have the cyber accepted service, which allows paying higher, uh, higher salaries, not enough to be competitive with the private sector. The missing element is bringing it all together and showing people that, we that we're willing to invest and to care about them. And so developing a, a, a program where you bring people in and, and you put them in a position where they understand that they're important to the mission and they're going to play a key role in what you're doing. There's nothing you can do more for, for employees than showing you care about them to, to, to build your recruiting and, and build your ability to retain key personnel. Well, I couldn't agree more. I think that goes across all businesses. Employee turnover is always the highest cost because you lose that institutional knowledge. So when we invest uh, in the long-term care of an employee, that means they take care of what they need to. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My time's expired. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Senator Rosen. Uh, now, I have just a few comments I'd like to make before we adjourn. Uh, first of all, uh, I was struck, uh, Mr. Grant, uh, at page 193 of your book, there is a caption to a cartoon that I think 
uh, captures the essence of everything we do here, and it is, we'd now like to open the floor to shorter speeches disguised as questions. So with that, let me open the floor to shorter speeches disguised as questions. But uh, a couple of observations, and uh, one is that uh, we have had several commentators, including the authors of the National Defense Strategy Report, indicating a, a shift uh, from civilian control of military to in professional military officers in control. One aspect of that might be is that if you look at uh, professional officers and even now senior enlisted, they have the opportunity, in fact, they're expected to go to graduate school and they're expected to go to military education schools, the General Staff College, et cetera. I don't think we have anything comparable to that in the civilian service. So what happens is you have a situation where you have a, a civilian and then someone's brought in, who uh, a younger perhaps officer, a captain or major, who has a PhD in systems analysis, and right away you have a, a, a sort of disparity between what we expect to be the civilian in charge versus the, the, the officer that's there for one or two years. Is this a serious issue, or is this something and something we should do about it? And your comments, Ms. Levine? I think there's a continuing tension, but I don't think the continuing tension is necessarily bad. I think that bringing different kinds of talent to focus on a problem and people with different perspective can be a good thing. And so I, 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 I hesitate to say that, 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 that this is a problem. It's a tension, but not necessarily a problem. But let me re reverse it. Should we have a comparable system for civilian employees of the Department of Defense so that they can mature and advance their skills as the, the uniform side does. Uh, absolutely. And, and, and we do have some of those systems. The problem is that we're not organized in how we use them for civilians. So we have civilian training. Um, civilian training sometimes is used as a reward. I have somebody good, so I'm going to send them off to training and to show them how much I like them. That doesn't, doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the job he's going to be doing or she's going to be doing when she gets back. Right. It's sometimes used as, as, as a way to get rid of somebody that they don't like and get, get them out of the office for six months, send them to training. Mm -hmm. It needs to be much more systematic in the way that it is in the military. Ms. Field, any comments? Uh, I would note that one of the things that the department has been experimenting with in the past few years, I think at the, the past of this uh, committee, has been the use of cross-functional teams, which bring civilians and, and mm -hmm. military personnel together for six months to two years where they leave their uh, day jobs and they focus on a critical issue. There was uh, one team focused on electromagnetic spectrum operations. Uh, and I think that that uh, experiment, while still very much an experiment, is one good way of bringing civilians and military officials together to think creatively and innovatively about an important problem. Dr. Grant, any comments? Sorry. Time, there we go. Yeah. Uh, substantial risk that we underinvest in leadership development for civilians, and oftentimes the, the capabilities are already there. I remember a few years back, I taught a leadership course uh, that involved a pretty extensive change simulation uh, that both civilians and um, generals and colonels were, were participating in. And the civilians in the DOD performed significantly better, uh, in part in, because instead of executing immediately, they actually stopped to plan. Uh, and I saw that and, and wondered, what are we doing to make sure that ability to pause and analyze is really being developed and harnessed in the DOD? And my hunch is not enough. Thank you. Uh, another issue, again, this is observational, not analytical, is that uh, we hire lots of contractors at the Department of Defense. Sometimes they're, they're essential because we don't have those skills. Uh, sometimes we've done it because we've cut back dramatically on civilians. Uh, and sometimes I think we do it because there's a at least short-run financial incentive uh, to hire the contractors, uh, but at the expense of the long run return of seasoned career professionals. And Dr. Lane, your comments on this, is this a problem or? Over-reliance on contractors can definitely be a problem. There, there, are, there are many places, as you know, where we rely on, on the special expertise we can get from outside the department. I think that in the cyber area, 
some of the things things we're talking about AI area, there may be skills uh, that, that we can access from the private sector that we can't build ourselves. The important thing is that we have to at least maintain enough expertise in the government that we understand what we're buying. Um, if we're not, if, if we don't have any expertise in, at all ourselves, if we contract it all out, then 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 we're we're just a victim. We can't we can't make smart decisions. We can't understand what we're doing, and I don't think we want to be in that position. <clears throat> Your comments, ma'am. Uh, yes, so a DOD a few years ago, as I'm sure you're aware, uh, did an assessment or tried to assess whether it was more expensive to use civilians or contractors in, in, in certain places, or military personnel for that matter. Uh, and the department determined, although it was using a non-judgmental sample, that there really wasn't a significant difference. So I think that's the, the, the first key piece to keep in mind is the, the cost is is not, not the driving factor here. So to your point then, the key consideration is what capabilities do we want in-house that we want to nurture, whether it be on the military side or the civilian side? One of the things we found is that the department has not assessed the mix of civilian contractor and military personnel throughout the department, and so we have recommended that the department do that. Thank you. Dr. Grant, any, any comments? I, I don't have data from within the DOD on this, but one of the things that I would put on the table is uh, in other industries we see that experience is a double-edged sword that on the one hand, it, it brings a lot of know-how. On the other hand, it also carries blinders and baggage. And sometimes people over-index on their internal experience. Uh, so I think that in some cases, it's possible that, that contractors bring fresh ideas and new perspectives, and we could benefit from that. And we ought to be documenting what that looks like. Uh, a final, and this is more of a thought or impression, is while the hearing was going on, I th and we were talking about innovation and creativity and how do we jump ahead, I thought of Alan Turning at Bletchley Hall, uh, in which uh, the British government, from the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Churchill, uh, basically said, "Leave them alone and let them do." Uh, and it was an interesting group of people, and they basically made a significant discovery that some would say uh, shaped or even determined the outcome of of the war. And do we need something like that, or do we have something like that already? I know DARPA does great work, but have we picked out the, the, a key element like quantum computing or AI and said, we're going to build at a not just DOD level, but a national level, this group of experts that are, and set them loose? So I think that Mr. Grant referred to a, a number of different or, DOD organizations that, that work in that way with, with uh, DIU and, and mm -hmm. NSIN and some of the others. Uh, he, had a, he had a list of them, I think, up front. But I, I think it's also important to recognize that it's still something that our military does at the, at the tactical and operational level. So we had people in Iraq and in Afghanistan in the field dealing with problems on a day-to-day -day basis and developing solutions. And so we shouldn't overlook the fact that we have innovators at all levels mm -hmm. of our organization who continue to perform well today. And there's some other examples that come to mind. I don't know whether they're classified, so I can't talk about them. But mm -hmm. where, where the people at the front end, at the, at the pointy end of the sword, in fact, are still able to innovate and still able to do some of that. That doesn't get to your question of, of a Manhattan Project kind of kind of thing, and, and um, I'm not sure what the Manhattan Project would be, so I don't I don't necessarily have a comment on that. Thank you, Ms. Fields. Uh, well, I would again point to cross-functional teams as one interesting model that that, that could be used mm -hmm. that could generate some interesting ideas in addition to all of the other various uh, innovative cells that Dr. Grant referenced. Um, I would say one thing to keep an eye on, which will be very interesting, are the new task forces that have, have been uh, just stood up or are in the process of being stood up on things like China and climate change and cyber. Um, those task forces, if approached from an experimental or innovative way, could be a really interesting opportunity for the department uh, to try new things and come up with new solutions on key problems. Thank you. And Dr. Grant, finally. One of the more encouraging trends that I've seen in the past couple of years in DOD is the development of courses around design thinking and innovative problem solving. And I think we have an adoption problem there, right? The, the expertise exists. It's not necessarily being disseminated. And I'd take a look at i and some of the other programs in place to try to figure out, can we spread this more widely? Thank you very much uh, for all your testimony and for your service to, to the country. And we really appreciate your comments today. With that, I will adjourn the hearing. Thank you.